Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining today's joint seminar on Afghanistan, the way forward. This event is put together by ISS and the High Commission of Pakistan in Singapore. We're also pleased to have Her Excellency, Her Excellency Ms. Ruksana Afzal, High Commissioner of Pakistan to Singapore, joining us this afternoon. I'm delighted to introduce our guest speaker, Ambassador Jalil Abbas Jalani, former Foreign Secretary of Pakistan and Pakistan's former ambassador to Belgium and the United States, who will be delivering his address on Afghanistan the way forward. Dr. Iqbal Singh Sevier, Visiting Research Associate Professor at ISIS, will chair and moderate the seminar. Before we proceed with the event, we would appreciate if the audience could switch off their microphones and videos throughout the session. If you have any questions or feedback to share, please forward them via the Zoom chat. The questions will be consolidated for the panelists to answer. Please note that this session is live streamed on ISA's Facebook page. I shall now invite Dr. Iqbal to chair this session. Dr. Iqbal, please. Thank you, Valtui. Um, good afternoon to everybody. Um, I'm encouraged to see the large number of people who've registered and are joining this um, discussion about the future of Afgan Afghanistan. Um, this seminar, as my colleague just highlighted, is jointly organized by the Institute of South Asian Studies and the High Commission of the Islamic Republic of Pakistan in Singapore. And I'm grateful to Pakistan's High Commissioner, Ruksana Afsal, and um, Ambassador Ong Keng Yong, Singapore's non-resident High Commissioner to Pakistan for facilitating this, um, this, this seminar. Um, the speed at which the Taliban consolidated their hold over Afghanistan in the days before the US withdrew its troops it has caught many by surprise. And apparently, including, it also caught the Taliban by surprise, the Taliban themselves by surprise as well. Um, in the past few weeks, the Taliban have announced the formation of an interim government and made significant announcements. These include an um, announcement stating that they will not allow Afghanistan to be used as a base to launch terrorist attacks against other states. They've also signaled their desire to gain recognition from the international community. And they have announced their aim to cultivate economic relations, including that of joining uh, CPAC, or China-Pakistan, the China-Pakistan Economic Corridor. And they've also announced that they will not replicate the draconian system of regulating the public sphere and social life, which they implemented um, 20 years ago when they were in power. The symbolically significant, sorry, excuse me, the symbolic significance of such announcements notwithstanding, in the past few weeks, there have been more questions and speculation over um, the future of Pakistan than clear, sorry, Afghanistan, than clear indications of the political, social, economic, and geopolitical future of Afghanistan. On the political front, they have formed what is tellingly called a interim government, but we have no signal of the future political structure of the Islamic Emirate. How, we also have no indication about how long this interim government will be in place, what sort of structure will be put in place to appoint the new government. We also have questions about the inclusivity of the interim government. Um, then there are also other questions relating to the political sphere itself. Will the Taliban be able to actually develop a structure of governance and control and be able to implement this in the geographically, economically, and culturally vibrant and diverse region, regions of uh, Afghanistan. Does the Taliban have the manpower to be able to govern Afghanistan? And will they opt to and be able to integrate administrators, policemen, and civil servants who are affiliated with the previous regime? On the economic front, as an insurgent movement, the Taliban has proved to be adept at drawing revenue from the legal and illegal logging industry, as well as the production of opium, as well as um, implementing attacks on the transportation of goods across Afghanistan, um, among others. But how will they go about developing an economic policy for Afghanistan? At a more immediate level, will they be able to pay the salaries of government workers? There's also the issue of foreign aid and access to foreign assets. Questions over Afghanistan's future social policies have drawn a fair amount of attention in the media. 
um, there are serious issues that need to be dealt with and engaged with about the agenda for their future gender policies and the role of women in society, the public sphere and the state. Also, we, we need to grapple with what would be the interpretation, what would be, a, what would be their interpretation of Sharia and what would this entail um, in the public space? Geopolitically, what sort of a role would states like China, Iran, Pakistan, India, Russia play in its future? Will Afghanistan once again emerge as a base for militancy? And perhaps more immediately, will the Taliban itself survive? Will the factions within the Taliban lead to, lead to fissures? Um, we have seen how the interim government itself has been a, a exercise in a balancing act, act of various factions. But there are also constant rumors of rifts, as, as we've seen in the media over just the last um, 48 hours itself, about the disappearance, apparent disappearance of Mullah Baradar. Um, but the Taliban also has its opponents within um, Afghanistan itself. These include um, not just those who have been fighting the Taliban for some time, but the rise of new militant groups such as the ISIS Khorasan as well. As we ponder with these questions, it is worth noting that the Taliban is confronted in Afghanistan with a new demographic challenge in itself. More than 50% of um, the people of Afghanistan are under the age of 25. And this is also a demographic that is very integrated into the use of technology but also one that is not as embedded in the traditional patient-client relations that have organized society in Afghanistan. Um, as it is my pleasure to, to today to, um, to welcome Pro Ambassador Jelani, who will help us think through some of, some of these questions and many more in the coming 20 minutes to half an hour. And then we will have a we'll follow up with a question and answer session. So Ambassador Jelani, welcome, and the floor is yours. Well, uh, thank you so much, uh, Mr. Iqbal Singh, for um, a very uh, 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 strong, very long introduction. I am extremely grateful to you, um, uh, Dr. C. Raja Mohan, uh, who is director of ISAS, who has been a, an old friend from my daily days. And I am also extremely grateful to um, uh, Ambassador Ong Jong, and Deputy Secretary Tech Han for the support that they have extended to uh, the hosting of this uh, webinar. I am also extremely grateful to uh, uh, my very, very dear colleague, Ambassador uh, Rukhsana Abzal for having taken this initiative uh, and inviting me to, to share my perspective on the evolving situation in Afghanistan. Uh, it is certainly an important issue for all of us uh, more so for Pakistan, because Pakistan is a country which is directly affected by the situation and developments in Afghanistan. You rightly pointed out, um, Mr. Iqbal, saying that uh, uh, stunning developments which took place in Afghanistan in August this year, they surprised everyone, including Afghan Taliban and including Pakistan, because uh, we, um, all of us, we had totally different projections and assessments about the way the situation was moving forward in Afghanistan. Uh, you're also absolutely right that the speed with which Taliban overwhelmed the entire country, it defied all projections. The Afghan government, the US administration, senior military commanders, all major think tanks, and strategic analysts had claimed that Afghan security forces would be able to withstand uh, and Afghan uh, and Taliban advances, uh, but that was not the case. The Afghan security forces, they surrendered without firing a shot and the Afghan government collapsed like a house of cards. With this Taliban victory uh, the, uh, and the collapse of Afghan government, in-depth analysis has already begun. Um, since, um, we, uh, all of us, we are in, who, are, who have remained engaged with Afghanistan, we don't like to accept blame. So accordingly, uh, we indulge in blame game. 
So the blame game has already started. Uh, blame game in the sense that Afghan um, government has blamed the US for um, uh, legit, uh, giving legitimacy to Afghan Taliban uh, uh, by signing an agreement in February last year, or for that matter, by um, engaging them since 2012, 13, or maybe perhaps 14, ever since the uh, Doha office of Taliban was established in Qatar, the US blaming Ashraf Ghani um, of corruption, mismanagement, and, uh, and uh, his for his failure to, uh, to um, uh, forge an internal consensus in support of the, of the peace process. Republicans in the U.S. they are also blaming um, the, um, uh, the the current administration uh, for, um, uh, for for having uh, ordered an abrupt withdrawal from Afghanistan. So you know this is something which is going on. Some analysts are maintaining that the U.S. NATO forces should have left Afghanistan much earlier. They were doomed to fail from day one because they lacked any knowledge of the, uh, the history, social, religious ethos, and also the, uh, the kind of traditions of Afghan society. Um, they, they feel that billions of dollars which were spent in Afghanistan, they were a complete waste. And uh, once the objective of uh, uh, defeating Al-Qaeda had been achieved, they should have left Afghanistan. Some other international um, analysts, they also, in my view, erroneously blame Pakistan for Taliban victory. They tend to forget that Taliban office had been established in Doha, Qatar in 2014. Their um, US Taliban uh, Western negotiation with Taliban had started much earlier than that. And then um, uh, the, the US signed an agreement with Afghan Taliban in, uh, in February uh, last year. And this is something, this is an aspect which was completely unknown to uh, either Pakistan or even the Western allies of the United States of America. Um, the, um, all these years, ever since these uh, intra-Afghan dialogue or the uh, US Afghan Taliban agreement took place, uh, Pakistan had been extending its fullest support uh, to, uh, to any effort that would uh, involve uh, the success of the intra afghan dialogue, reduction of violence, of, for that matter, uh, the, uh, uh, the, the success of the intra afghan dialogue. I think the, uh, we also need to remember that in the last 20 years or so, Pakistan on several occasions, um, senior uh, U.S. leadership not to wage a full-fledged war in Afghanistan, and rather they should consider um, targeted action against Al-Qaeda because that was perhaps the best possible uh, uh, thing to do at that particular stage because the main enemy of all of us was Al-Qaeda, which had orchestrated these uh, heinous attacks uh, uh, in New York on 9-11. Um, at another level, um, I remember that we also suggested to the uh, U.S. administration at the highest level that they should engage with reconcilable Taliban because that is the time when we received certain indications uh, that Taliban leadership, they were willing to engage, they were willing to compromise, they were willing to, they were not very strong at that particular stage. And I think that perhaps, again, from our point of view, what would have been a much better idea because if that agreement had taken place or that development taken place in 2005, ever since Pakistan made this suggestion, things would have been slightly different. Now, um, as expected, post-martyr of the Afghan situation, um, it has already started. It will continue for uh, a long time. But I think uh, it is extremely imperative that um, our focus, the focus of the international community, uh, should be on the future of Afghanistan and welfare of the people, which is threatened by on ongoing uncertainty and economic hardship, which is being felt by the faced by the new government uh, and the people. Um, uh, the, you know, perspective in Pakistan is 
that while international community is adjusting to the new reality and adjusting its policies towards Afghanistan and making efforts um, or uh, may at some stage um, uh, reconcile with a Taliban-led government in Afghanistan, uh, there are certain, certainly questions uh, with regard to their ideology, the form of government capacity, and their linkages with the uh, extremist organizations, and the way they are going to treat um, uh, women and uh, other, uh, a common man, uh, whether they would be uh, subjected to harsh treatment by. Uh, so these are some real apprehensions which are being ex expressed by everybody, including Pakistan. But then I would say that despite positive signals emanating from the Afghan Taliban, many in the US and West, besides other members of the international community, uh, they remain unsure if Taliban will uh, prove to be a credible interlocutor because there is definitely a trust deficit between Afghan Taliban and, the, and various interlocutors who are trying to engage with the Afghan Taliban. Or uh, if they have the capacity to govern, and this is something which uh, you have very rightly pointed out, all these questions are being raised by everybody. And this is something which is also, which um, are being discussed and debated in Pakistan as well. And whether they will sever their links with the with various terrorist uh, groups who were operating um, in Afghanistan, like Al-Qaeda, like uh, uh, ISIK, uh, like ETIM, IMU, um, TTP, et cetera, et cetera, and, you know, or LET, et cetera. So all these are organizations are the ones about which there are genuine concerns and everybody would like them to uh, take some uh, verifiable steps against these elements to, uh, to, uh, um, to eliminate them from Afghan soil so that they, are, they do not pose a threat to any country uh, for that matter. And then, obviously, there is a valid question with regard to the formation of an uh, inclusive government, uh, which um, uh, we feel and the international community feels is also vital for peace and stability in, in Pakistan. But then, if you look at the uh, developments which have taken place in Afghanistan since August uh, this year, there is a, uh, 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 there is a um, a kind of a uh, uh, some positive signals which have emanated from the uh, um, uh, 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 from the uh, uh, Taliban side. For instance, they have uh, announced that their immediate priority will be number one to seek international legitimacy and recognition. So this is something which is uh, very important for the Afghan Taliban. Secondly, they have stated that they would like to retain public goodwill internally for carrying out social welfare activities. Thirdly, they have said that they would retain, um, uh, 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 they would sort of uh, make their best efforts for economic revival and uh, uh, to seek uh, international investments to explore um, unexploited mineral resources in Afghanistan. Um, uh, formation of an inclusive government also remains one of the priorities uh, for, for them. They've also announced that they would like to preserve Islamic character of Afghanistan and align their policies with international norms to the maximum possible within the confines of social, cultural, religious, and traditional values of the Afghan society. And then, of course, uh, um, uh, their main priority at this stage would remain the, uh, the economic revival and economic well-being of my, you know, We feel in Pakistan that it would be unrealistic to expect the Afghan Taliban to completely transform themselves overnight. They have been, uh, in case uh, uh, the leadership, the main leadership, they have acquired a certain uh, knowledge, they have acquired a certain uh, 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 sort of uh, kind of a uh, the uh, sense the mood of the international community and also if they have uh, also been uh, tired and fatigued and they, they would like to have a peaceful Afghanistan, 
there is certainly a different or orientation on the part of many of the lower cadres of the Afghan Taliban. And that is something that also be taken into account while sort of uh, discussing this uh, situation uh, in Afghanistan. So this is something that we have to basically grapple with. Um, they have, for instance, in the last one decade, uh, since uh, 2010, 11, they have engaged with uh, all uh, major uh, global players uh, with interests in Afghanistan. They have you know, engaged with the United States of America very, very closely. They have engaged with uh, the, the European countries. They had developed a very close interaction with China. Russia is also became a major interlocutor for Afghan Taliban in the last eight, 10 years. Iran is again something, another country which developed very close relationship with uh, Afghan Taliban. And then many of the Central Asian republics, they also developed uh, connections with, uh, with Afghan Taliban. Um, uh, of course, you know, we were engaged with them uh, uh, on a regular basis. And then um, they are also showing a lot of strategic maturity and they have expressed their willingness to address the concerns of international community related to terrorism, inclusive government, human rights, et cetera. Et cetera. Uh, they have, interestingly, they have become media some. If you uh, look at the uh, Afghan, Afghanistan dispensation, you know, the rule of the 90s, um, you hardly saw their pictures in the newspapers or their interaction on television. But these days, since um, uh, the last couple of years, they are all over. They are uh, in the media. They are uh, um, the uh, Haqqani, Siraj Haqqani writing an article for New York Times, Siraj Haqqani writing an article for uh, the Washington Post being given space by uh, the international media. They are there on um, television network, and then you know the uh, they have kind kind of overcome their shyness to a large uh, extent. They have also co-opted major ethnic groups in Afghanistan um, since launching their uh, operations. They they um, took uh, you know the interestingly they first took control of the non Pashtun areas. Um, and um, and then again, you know, without any violence, without any fighting, uh, the uh, non-Pashtun areas they also joined their ranks. In other words, and then um, they made the local leaders as in charge of the respective uh, areas, the non-Pashtun areas I'm referring to. And interestingly, the commander who led the uh, military operations in Panjshir Valley was also a Tajik. And then subsequently, the, um, the, the person who has been appointed as the governor of uh, Panjshir province, he is also a, a, a Tajik. Uh, so that basically shows the kind of uh, a, a, a new thinking on their part. They have declared protection of all minorities in recent weeks. They, were, they provided protection to Muharram uh, procession. You, you know, this is something which was unimaginable. Muharram procession is a Shia. Um, uh, uh, procession and in that uh, Shia profession, they uh, you know provided protection to the mourners, and uh, which was again something which gave a signal of their uh, uh, co-opting all minorities in the in the new dispensation. Uh, they are perceived to follow the Deobandi uh, sect of Islam, uh, which is a hardline Sunni group. However, they have established. Uh, extremely close cooperation and close relationship with, Iraq, with Shia Iran. And they have announced general amnesty for all, including their foes and members of the previous government. They have announced that they would be very happy to, uh, to um, induct the uh, civil servants which were hired by the previous government, as well as members of the armed forces who, had, who were working with the, with the previous government. And they have also indicated that uh, women would be allowed to receive um, higher education. The um, uh, obviously it would be a segregated uh, affair in in Afghanistan in the context of Afghanistan. But then you know, despite all these signals which have originated from Afghan Taliban, um, Taliban, in our view, would certainly face a hard time in securing 
de jure recognition. I have absolutely not, no doubt that they have uh, been accorded de facto recognition uh, for a very long time. They are seen as one group which has the potential to, uh, to, um, to uh, stabilize Afghanistan. And that's accordingly, um, many of the countries, they had started uh, dealing with them for a very long time. But, but, uh, but then the problem is that many of these countries who had accorded uh, de facto recognition to Afghan Taliban, they had uh, created an extremely negative narrative um, for their own uh, public, for their own constituents, uh, for the last almost 20 years, they were bad people. They were sort of, uh, they violated uh, women's rights, they violated uh, human rights, and accordingly, um, uh, they will not be able to form the government in Afghanistan. But now with this new re reality, uh, I think um, uh, while they uh, remain willing to engage with them, with them uh, probably, um, uh, they will find a hard time in um, creating a positive narrative and it is perhaps take, it will probably take some time before they're able to uh, do that. Um, the, uh, uh, but then, you know, the latest, latest developments that we have seen following this terrorist attack, we have seen that almost every country was, uh, uh, was engaged with them, uh, whether it, they were European countries or Asian countries, and Taliban were also extending their fullest support during the, uh, the attack that took place, or for that matter, for the um, evacuation of, uh, of uh, uh, either uh, the foreign forces, the civilians, or uh, for that matter, the Afghans who wanted to leave Afghanistan. Um, in our view, there is uh, certainly a close linkage between um, a good governance, uh, law and order situation, and um, uh, and the uh, and the uh, economic situation uh, prevalent in any country, and Afghanistan is certainly not an exception. Uh, Afghanistan situation, economic situation, has uh, deteriorated for the you know for the last several months, but and more so after uh, the Taliban takeover of uh, Afghanistan. Uh, the reason being that uh, most of the financial commitment. Uh, that was made in respect of Afghanistan, whether from the International Monetary Fund, uh, which was to release $460 million, or for that matter, the assistance that was to come from the World Bank, that has been frozen. The uh, Afghanistan uh, money, which, is, uh, which was deposited in uh, US Treasury, about $10 billion, that has also been frozen. And the uh, uh, amount pledged by the donor countries in Geneva last year, about $12 billion to be spread over a period of four years. Um, that has also been suspended. Uh, many other countries have also suspended assistance to Afghanistan. Uh, the new government doesn't have the uh, funds to pay for the salaries to provide basic needs of the people and continuation. Um, and this you know, continuation of this situation is certainly a recipe for uh, disaster. It would lead to um, a law and order situation. Already food shortages are being felt in Afghanistan. Medi uh, uh, there is short supply of medicines, hospitals. Many of the hospitals do not have the, even the necessary medicines which are urgently needed for the people of Afghanistan. Um, the, in our view, uh, in, this, in case this kind of a situation is allowed to continue, for a long time, it would uh, certainly uh, lead to a civil war and um, would also provide uh, space to terrorist uh, organizations like Al-Qaeda, uh, ISIS to gain more uh, strength. Uh, this situation certainly can be avoided by generous financial assistance and opening of channels of communication with the people. If, um, for instance, with the help of the international community, the situation moved, moves towards stability, it would certainly create a win-win situation for the, for the Afghans, Afghanistan's neighbors, and the international community. And recognition will also be essential to avert uh, economic uh, collapse. Uh, on the other hand, Taliban certainly will be required to, and I think this is something which should be made uh, uh, contingent on 
that they should uh, demonstrate a practical uh, uh, demonstration to fulfill their commitments of, you know, for an inclusive government, which I believe that they are trying to work very hard. And also, you know, on in eliminating these organizations that had established their base and who were also who had also become a threat to the neighboring countries and the international community. So, and also they, they would need to improve the human rights situation as well as the situation of uh, women in Afghanistan. Um, in my view, uh, they will always be spoilers and mischief makers who can be uh, identified based on our past experience. But the, uh, the positive indication that we have received in recent weeks is that uh, there is a general consensus amongst the regional countries uh, who are engaged with uh, Afghanistan at the moment, that they would not allow um, these mischief makers to create any difficulties, or for that matter, they will not uh, give, extend any support to elements who wish to, uh, to uh, perpetuate uh, the civil war in Afghanistan. So these are some of the positive developments. And then I think it is equally uh, important that Afghanistan's uh, neutrality should be maintained at all co costs. Afghanistan should not uh, become a battleground for, uh, for uh, various, uh, uh, for outside interests, I would say. A cooperative and uh, coordinated approach is something um, that would help stabilize uh, Afghanistan. Uh, you know, that is something which is of uh, paramount importance. Uh, I think the, um, if we talk about the way forward, I think the way for forward is that rather than constantly talking about managing a humanitarian crisis, I think the, all of us, the international community, we should try and avert a situation which would lead to this humanitarian crisis. The average Afghan for the last 40 years, he has suffered enormously. And I think uh, uh, we, they, uh, the, the common Afghan people, they deserve our support. And we must do everything uh, that helps mitigate their uh, problems. Uh, we must work out a mechanism of humanitarian and uh, development support for uh, uh, a mechanism for Afghan, Afghanistan, perhaps under UNAMA, which, which uh, should also be strengthened in Afghanistan in, uh, in view of the, uh, the current situation to ensure that uh, Afghanistan becomes a stable Afghanistan and we uh, uh, are able to avert a breakdown of governance and security. Uh, engagement and dispensation uh, with the new Afghan government would be of paramount importance. Uh, I think this is uh, important to prevent an um, economic collapse, ensure good governance, improved human rights situation, and avoid security vac vacuum. In case a security vacuum is created, that is our experience is that that is all, always exploited by the, by the extremist organizations. We must not repeat the mistakes of the 90s. Abandonment of Afghanistan will be, will, uh, you know, uh, will create a mass exodus and a refugee crisis. We already have 3 million refugees in Pakistan. There are refugees in other countries. Many more are willing to go to the Western countries. So it would create uh, you know, uh, and an enormous difficulties for almost every country. I think the best uh, uh, possible strategy would be to um, ensure that uh, situation in Afghanistan is improved so that people are not, uh, uh, they, they do not uh, move to other countries. Um, but luckily this time, contrary to the expectations that we all had, we thought that there is going to be another influx of refugees in Pakistan this time after the Taliban take over, but certainly that has not taken place. Uh, barring uh, five to uh, 10,000 people, which is very small, um, uh, we haven't really received um, uh, any more refugees this time. Uh, so I think uh, that also um, reflects a degree of the hope 
that a new dispensation uh, in Afghanistan has created for the people of, uh, uh, of Afghanistan. Uh, but at the same time, while we provide assistance to Afghanistan and a new dispensation, it is equally important that we continue to press upon Taliban that they must um, uh, um, ensure that the commitments that they have made with the international community, they are followed in red letter and spirit. And these obviously commitments include, uh, uh, they need to protect the rights of uh, women, Afghan men and women, and ensure that Afghanistan's soil is not used for, uh, for terrorist activities in other countries. Um, they uh, have to make, uh, uh, take everybody, uh, all ethnic groups on board. Uh, but then, um, uh, in my view, uh, the form and makeup of the Afghan government should be the decision of the new authorities in Pakistan. Pakistan has made its views on the above issues already clear uh, for uh, to Afghan Taliban. One uh, last point that I would like to make is that as far as leverage of the international community, I think the uh, leverage at this stage of the international community uh, in respect of Afghanistan is perhaps more than, um, than Pakistan's leverage. Uh, I think the, uh, 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 the international community by offering financial assistance and legitimacy to Taliban government will have far greater sway over the new government. Um, and then they should, uh, uh, we should all uh, consider incentivizing the uh, uh, positive behavior by the by engaging them constructively. A coordinated approach is of paramount importance. I think we need, need to uh, interact and coordinate very, very closely at this stage. And then um, um, uh, through this coordination, we can not only ensure that Taliban also modify their behavior, but then they also, uh, that you know, we can also uh, make our support contingent on uh, on uh, on addressing international communities concerns as far as we are concerned we have vital stakes in peace and stability in afghanistan the four decades of war in afghanistan has resulted in 3 million refugees a destabilized border uh, for, on, on, you know for pakistan terrorism and also has caused huge loss to pakistan's economy um, which is uh, estimated as at more than $152 billion. Um, lastly, I would say uh, uh, that even since uh, August this year should induce an introspection amongst all of us, all of us who are interested in peace, stability and, uh, in Afghanistan and the uh, imperatives of uh, formulating policies which are based on ground realities in Afghanistan. I thank you, Ed, and I think we could now have a have a uh, an interactive question answer session, and with which I think probably we will be able to bring in some more clarity on some of the points that my uh, talk may have uh, raised in the minds of some of the other people. Thank you, Ambassador Jilani, for that um, stimulating talk. You've given us. Um, more to ponder about and um, much more to chew upon as well. Um, there are questions coming in and while I'll give the audience um, time to, to write their question, maybe I'll just um, throw one general broad question out, which um, I believe some others might want to ask as well later on in different forms. Um, but to start the ball rolling, can we, can we speak of the Taliban as one unified entity um, as we think about their future political, social, economic moves. Um, is, it, is it fair to speak of them as, as one entity? You know, um, again, this is an important question, which is there in the minds of uh, many in Pakistan as well as the international community. But if we look at the developments of the last 20 years, this question were raised on many occasions. Um, when a ceasefire was announced during the month of Ramadan, 
Um, there were questions that some of the cadres they did not like uh, the ceasefire to be announced, but the leadership wanted an announcement. The, uh, the, uh, wanted a ceasefire during the month of Ramadan, or for that matter, during the the uh, religious occasions. Similarly, um, on the question of Taliban engaging with the with the U.S. and other international community, um, there were many cadres. Again, uh, there were, you know, these are kind of, these are the kind of reports that we also saw that they were very unhappy with the Taliban leadership engaging with uh, the U.S. or the manner uh, these negotiations were taking place. Or, for that matter, these questions also arose. I remember that when we were promoting, all of us, we were promoting intra-Afghan dialogue. There were many um, Taliban cadres who were raising questions with regard to the efficacy of this intra-Afghan dialogue, as for that matter, Ashraf Ghani also did exactly the same thing. Um, but then um, they did, all of them, they did engage with each other. They did engage with the, uh, with the US side. They, uh, when the leadership dropped their demands, they had made three demands, uh, the withdrawal of foreign forces, um, repeal of the constitution, because they said that we do not accept the constitution and the government which has been formed under the same constitution. But they, all, they dropped all their demands and engaged with all these, uh, these actors. It did not break the Taliban uh, cadres. They may have raised objections at some point of time, but they did not, um, they were not, we didn't uh, detect any defections from their cadres, any, you know, during that. My sense is that they have emerged as perhaps the most well-organized political party. Uh, the leadership that they have acquired, uh, the Taliban, they, that is a very mature leadership. Uh, it's a very uh, diplomatic savvy, uh, leadership. They have, um, uh, I think, uh, in terms of negotiation, they have uh, uh, also acquired uh, great skills. And they have negotiated a very good agreement with the United States of America last year from their point of view. So I think the, uh, uh, with this kind of a situation, uh, this uh, talk of uh, any division or any defection, my own sense is that that is certainly that is something that would perhaps not take place. At the end of the day, they, you know, some people may raise objection to some of the steps that Taliban leadership may take, but at the end of the day, they would all uh, concede and remain united uh, because that's the strength that they have demonstrated in the last 20 years. Thank you, and um, I'm going to go off, going go into the questions that have come onto uh, the chat. So let me start with um, what one of the questions I said is a practical question. Um, what can Pakistan do to support Afghanistan in improving its human development, especially at this critical juncture in its nation building? And the question is, in in terms of human development, I think um, it is certainly. Um, um, it is the responsibility of uh, the Afghan government to basically move forward in that direction. What Pakistan can do is uh, to extend a helping hand. And the same he helping hand can also be extended by other countries. For instance, uh, the new Taliban leadership would require skilled people to run their uh, municipal, municipal administration to sanitation department, their uh, hospitals, their um, government, the police, their uh, army. So it is going to be a gigantic task for the new government. And, which, and many of those people who were part of the previous government, they have fled the country. Now, but the Afghan side, Afghan, the new Afghanistan dispensation has asked them to come back or, and work there. They have announced general amnesty, but I don't think the lure of uh, working in Europe or uh, the United States of America would uh, um, compel them to uh, come back to Afghanistan uh, 
particularly at this stage when the situation still remains a little uncertain. Uh, we have already, uh, or you talk about the human development, we, uh, we, have, we extend uh, 6,000 scholarships to Afghan students to study in Pakistan's technical uh, institutions. That certainly will continue. Um, there are many, we have produced a large number of uh, doctors, engineers for Afghanistan who have studied in Pakistani institutions. Uh, so I think this is the kind of uh, uh, support that Pakistan can certainly um, extend to them. And in case uh, uh, their um, police or the, uh, the army would require uh, any training facility, we have certainly some of the best training institutions uh, in our region and we can certainly provide that that uh, that kind of training also. Uh, then um, I think uh, they would also need economists to run the economy. I am not really sure about the capacity of the new dispensation in Afghanistan, but then again, that is an, an important area that and uh, uh, and uh, I think probably they will have to offer incentives to uh, their good economists, uh, Afghan economists who are working outside Afghanistan to come back and help the new government in running the economy. And that your, your answer provides a segue to one, two more questions. One, one I think you've addressed somewhat already, the issue of um, Pakistan's assistance in developing educational institutions and the whole educational project in Afghanistan. The other being um, the role that Pakistan could play in helping those who were internally displaced during the civil war, um, as the, the questioner has, has described it, and those who will flee the Taliban rule. Well, um, as I mentioned that um, um, in case they were uh, any elements who wanted to flee Afghanistan because of fear of Taliban. Uh, we have, um, uh, we already, as I mentioned that we already have about five to 10,000 people who uh, probably left Afghanistan because of this fear. And most of those pe people in my view are the affluent Afghans who left Afghanistan and they, and certainly we have uh, witnessed a surge in pro property prices in a, in Islamabad and in Peshawar and in, in other parts of the country bordering Afghanistan. So that is, uh, that is very much, but then the, and uh, frankly speaking, um, uh, we have uh, looked after these people very well in the past, uh, which is something which has been acknowledged by all the previous governments in Afghanistan and, um, uh, and also by, it is acknowledged by, by the international community as well. Thank you. Um, there's another question which asks, um, what kind of, uh, in your estimation, what kind of popular support does the Taliban have in, in, uh, in Afghanistan itself? And um, would they be able to set up a government that would enjoy popular support in the future? Well, um, I think, uh, you know, from our perspective, Taliban were able to take control of the whole of Afghanistan because of the popular support that they enjoyed. There was also a great disillusionment with the previous two governments, whether it was President Karzai's government or for that matter, Ashraf Bani's, President Ashraf Bani's government. Uh, so Taliban, as you are aware, they had taken control of uh, uh, almost 70% of Taliban, 70% of the Afghan area for a very long time. I think probably for the last, say, seven to eight years, despite the presence of US and NATO forces. And wherever they took control, particularly mainly in the rural areas, they, I think, managed those rural areas very well in terms of uh, providing basic necessities to the people of that, those areas, providing uh, health facilities, providing uh, food, and also providing speedy justice. And uh, that is something. And then their, uh, their uh, rule in the trap in the rural areas was also, uh, you know, free from any corruption. So that, these were some of the main strengths of the, of the, uh, in case, but then again, I would say that everything depends on the 
uh, on the provision of basic uh, amenities to the people. There are expectations from almost everybody in, uh, in Afghanistan with the new dispensation. In case we extend a helping hand economically to them, then I think uh, they would perhaps be able to govern in a much better fashion uh, as compared to their rule in the 90s. So that's uh, something which is which we have to keep in mind. We have a number of questions relating to the potential official recognition of the Taliban government. Uh, yes. Afghanistan. Um, uh, a number of people have asked the question in different forms, but essentially, yeah. what is Pakistan's position on this issue? Two, is there any indication of um, the, do you have any indication of the views of other South Asian countries on the issue of whether they would recognize, potentially recognize um, the Taliban government? And what about internationally? So I've condensed a number of questions in there. Well, my own sense is, yes, I know I'll first talk about Pakistan. I think uh, for us, recognition at this point is not very important. Uh, we will take a decision along with the international community. So that's the decision that we have already taken within our own system. And this is something that we have also conveyed uh, to uh, the important members of the international community, whosoever is engaged and interested in all Secondly, I think uh, uh, what we have been able to gather is that everybody is uh, engaged with them at this stage. Uh, everybody is talking to them. Uh, and uh, I think um, uh, there is also a desire to help them uh, uh, somewhat provided uh, they are able to address uh, their concerns. Uh, Russia has also indicated that uh, Taliban are, are a reality and they, have, they need to be engaged. Uh, China has also indicated the same. German Chancellor um, also made a statement about uh, two weeks ago that uh, she, she, uh, the Germany also feels that Taliban are a reality and need to be engaged. But as I mentioned in my initial remarks, the problem is basically the respective uh, constituencies, respective parliaments, the, and the media. Something that had been um, uh, kind of uh, a negative narrative, it would perhaps, it would require some time before they're able to change it. Um, but, and then uh, we also, uh, one point that I would like to mention is that all these countries that I am talking, whether the European, whether the US, whether it's uh, the neighboring countries, Russia, they are uh, engaged, some, uh, most of them, they are engaged in a very discreet fashion. I think probably the time has come when we, uh, they also need to come out in the public domain, those engagements. Uh, perhaps that would also help understand the situation in a much better perspective. Following up on that, do you do you foresee official recognition for the government? Well, uh, the, I'm talking about the official recognition. Sure. Official recognition will perhaps take some time. Um, you know, we uh, we also need to, uh, and Pakistan is certainly aligned with the uh, international community when it comes to. Uh, the inclusive government when it comes to the protection of human rights and also when it comes to um, uh, the uh, uh, to the actions against various extremist groups which have formed Afghanistan as their base. Uh, these are the kind of uh, ongoing negotiations. And but then one thing I must uh, point it up, point out here that you know uh, as of now we also need to coordinate very very closely with us. Uh, we also need to help. Uh, the people of Afghanistan by providing uh, some financial assistance. Simply by making these demands on the new dispensation and not helping economically or helping uh, in their uh, humanitarian issues uh, would certainly not take us anywhere. I think there has to be a coordinated approach. Both these, both the demands and the assistance should move simultaneously. And greater engagement between uh, all the countries, the neighboring countries, as well as the United States of America and the European countries. That leads nicely to another series of questions on the, um, the flow of financial aid into Afghanistan. Um, firstly, do you see that picking up in the coming days? 
um, what sort of concerns will hinder the, um, the flow of financial aid, but also can financial aid be actually used as a, as a, um, as a bargaining chip with the Taliban? I think certainly uh, it would incentivize the Taliban to, uh, to take some uh, more actions. It would certainly help uh, build their capacity. It would also help satisfy their own cadres to a large extent who are also governing various areas, districts and also provinces. So th this is something which would be uh, in, in extremely critical, this financial assistance, economic assistance. Because unless you have, you know, the basic facilities available to you uh, by co-opting everybody from within Afghanistan would be a difficult proposition for the Taliban themselves. So that is why I think, uh, and in case assistance is provided to them, nobody is expecting that uh, uh, number one, there would be any uh, corruption that they will, they have been generally very, uh, you know, they have been honest with their dealings. Uh, they, um, one expects them to, to uh, run the administration in a more uh, efficient manner in a less, in a, in a corruption free environment. But then again, these are the kind of things which will be tested when uh, the Afghanistan, when the Afghan Taliban are empowered. Without testing their abilities, um, all these, um, uh, you know, this uh, all the all this narrative would only be the kind of uh, would fall in the realm of uh, speculations. And um, another question that deals with something you, you mentioned earlier about um, the the support or lack of support for the Taliban in Afghanistan. This question asks. What are the prospects of Afghanistan ever getting a government that enjoys popular support? <laughs> well, I, I have already responded to it that in case they did not enjoy a popular support in Afghanistan, they would have not come back into power. I think they organized themselves very well. As I mentioned earlier, that the areas that they managed in the last uh, eight to 10 years, almost 60 to 70 percent of Afghanistan, they were very well managed uh, by them. Uh, the people of Afghanistan, they had also showed a degree of confidence in their ability to, to, to govern. So um, popular government, uh, popularity is also directly linked to, uh, to, the, to meeting people's expectations. People, they have welcomed them. There is absolutely no doubt. One indication is the absence of any refugees, either in Pakistan or in the neighboring countries. Those who have fled to other countries were also encouraged by, the, by some of the, those governments because those people were working with the, with the foreign governments and foreign forces. But otherwise people, they have generally not, not left. But then how long would this popularity remain is a big question. Uh, the, uh, and I think that is something which is directly linked to the provide provision of uh, assistance and provena. My own thing is that in case assistance is provided to, to them, then they will be able to uh, provide at least the basic facilities, amenities to their people. They would also uh, consider, in, you know, they would certainly help improve the human rights situation in Afghanistan. But then in case, uh, help is not forthcoming. It's a huge country. It's, a, it's an underdeveloped country and um, the, it, which has a lot which has a lot of potentials. So they will not be able to, I think initiate the initial stages, they need help. And subsequently when uh, they start receiving investments in Afghanistan and the uh, huge mineral resources that they have, perhaps they will be able to stand on their feet. And uh, I have absolutely no doubt that one entity, which if helped, would help stabilize situation in Afghanistan and uh, would also be able to co-opt all ethnic groups, which they have. Incidentally, uh, when Taliban took over uh, Afghanistan, uh, the Taliban opposition, 
members of Taliban opposition, members of the former Northern Alliance, they all were in Pakistan. Uh, 12 main leaders of the former Northern Alliance, they had come to Pakistan just one week, one day before the Taliban takeover. And uh, I have, um, I was told by someone the other day that many of them, they still remain in Pakistan. So that's something that uh, also demonstrates that uh, besides our channels of communications with Afghan Taliban for the last several years, we had also established channels of communications with the former uh, Northern Alliance. Uh, I have strong reason to believe because these people are also uh, looking at the kind of reaction that will come from the international community. But in case the uh, international reaction to the new dispensation in Afghanistan is positive, many of them, they would be willing to join Afghan setup. Uh, you know, this is something that, uh, and I have very strong reason to, to believe in this, uh, in this uh, narrative. Another question asked, the world has become bipolar once again with the US and its allies and China, Shrove Russia and their allies looking to strengthen their influence. How do you see this dynamic impacting the Taliban government, both the positives and the negatives of this? You know, again, uh, if you recall my initial remarks, uh, I said that, you know, we should not use Afghanistan for our own, uh, you know, narrow interests. Uh, this uh, uh, this uh, uh, the, uh, the new strategies which are developed would also impact on the situation in Afghanistan. Uh, there is a very strong perception in our region that perhaps in case um, stability comes to Afghanistan, uh, it would give uh, a major advantage to China because China remains uh, popular with all ethnic groups in Afghanistan. It has, uh, it, has, it, uh, it has engaged with them in the past. It continues to engage with, uh, with uh, all the ethnic groups and they would all accept Chinese investments in Afghanistan. So that is again a, 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 an issue which is extensively uh, being debated in this region. Uh, so again, uh, I think probably uh, for uh, for a better future of Afghanistan, I think there has to be a dialogue between uh, U.S. and China that uh, Afghanistan will not fall in the category of uh, countries where they are, uh, you know, with competing interests between the two power centers and that they would ensure that Afghanistan remains stable. And as far as uh, development of Afghanistan or investments in Afghanistan or um, exploiting uh, mineral resources that could also form part of uh, a joint uh, uh, kind of a strategy to be pursued by not only the United States of America, uh, China, Russia, and other countries. Uh, we certainly feel that uh, in case Afghanistan gets stable, then many of the stack of projects uh, which uh, we would like to pursue, which uh, Afghanistan would like to pursue, and the Afghanistan people of Afghanistan would also like to pursue, are number one, the extension of China-Pakistan economic corridor to Afghanistan. Secondly, um, the revival of CASA, and then uh, revival of uh, 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 TAPI, uh, Turkmenistan, Afghanistan, Pakistan, India, gas pipeline project, which is also struck up which is stuck because of the ongoing uncertainty in Afghanistan. So in case there is a stability, then I think, as I mentioned earlier, it would certainly create a win-win situation for everybody, um, for the US, for China, for Russia, for regional countries, and uh, Afghanistan. Moving from international geopolitics to South Asian geopolitics, there are a few questions that were asked, um, questions relating to India, Pakistan. And to summarize these questions, how do you foresee India-Pakistan relations being affected by the Taliban takeover in Afghanistan? And also, what sort of role, you've, you've spoken about the role that you envisage Pakistan should play, what sort of role do you envisage India playing? And what sort of role should it play in Afghanistan? No, I think we, again, we have been saying for a very long time 
that uh, any country playing a role in Afghanistan should be within the confines of uh, legitimacy. So any country pursuing a role in Afghanistan for development, for economic well-being of the people, that is something that would be welcomed by everybody. But in case the role is uh, meant to destabilize other countries, again, that is something that would create enormous difficulties. As far as uh, Pakistan economic, uh, sorry, Pakistan-India relations and uh, the situation in Afghanistan, I think, uh, uh, you know, the overall perception in Pakistan would be that uh, uh, we will have, you know, uh, we had very serious apprehensions with regard to the support that was being extended to certain hostile groups in Afghanistan against Pakistan. Uh, you know, the, uh, some of the support that was being extended to some of the elements from Balochistan, like BLA, BRA, and also TTP in Afghanistan. So uh, that is something that would uh, certainly uh, come down significantly. That, that is a positive for Pakistan. I was reading an um, um, editorial in the Hindu newspaper of, you know, with which um, my dear friend uh, C. Raja Mohan is also closely associated. And the editorial also mentioned one sentence which was, uh, which was you know, I felt it quite intriguing when it said that it would also undermine India's uh, ability to um, to uh, to uh, to uh, the exact word was to uh, launch covert operations against Pakistan. So you know that is if that is the Hindu edit editorial that I would share it with uh, Ambassador Rosana, which she can share it with you. So you know that is the kind of apprehension that uh, we had. I have dealt with this Pakistan India uh, issues for a very long time in my diplomatic career, and I have. Uh, was also closely associated with Pakistan-India peace process of 2003 to 2008. And I think it was a wonderful uh, peace process. And it would, in case it, the process had succeeded, it would have uh, created a new dynamic in Pakistan-India relations as well as in the region and also at, at the global level. But then uh, for any peace process, uh, there are certain basic parameters that we had, and there, those parameters were very much in place in 2003 to 2000. One, the statesmanship and uh, commitment of the leadership to the peace process at the highest level is of the paramount importance. Uh, I think um, Prime Minister Vajpayee did demonstrate a lot of uh, statesmanship when when in April of 2003, and mind you, that was the height of tension between Pakistan and India. We had, uh, the India had, uh, had uh, moved uh, troops against Pakistan border. It was the, probably the largest ever mobilization of Indian troops against Pakistani border from 2001 to 2002. And before that, many uh, of uh, very unpleasant uh, you know, developments had taken place in our relations, Cargill attack on the Indian parliament, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But then Prime Minister Vajpayee, he went to uh, the Indian occupied Kashmir and he stated that we would like to resolve, and he's on record as having stated, uh, that we would like to resolve the Jammu and Kashmir dispute in accordance with, uh, with insaniyat, which is uh, humanity, and in accordance with, with, uh, uh, with Jamhuriyat, which is uh, democratic principles. So that basically generated a feel good factor. Uh, we, uh, so, you know, statesmanship is very, very important. Secondly, I think support by the, by the opposition parties is very important to any peace process. Media, thirdly, media plays a very important role. And core constituencies, they also play a very important role in, a, in any peace process. Core constituencies, in my view, are uh, people who actually implement the you know, policies or the uh, vision of the leadership. And uh, lastly, uh, support by the international community uh, is of critical importance to a peace uh, process between India and Pakistan. Uh, unfortunately, as of now, when we are discussing this issue, all these elements are missing uh, from this, uh, uh, you know, which I mentioned in the equation. 
I have a series of questions here with relations to, which relate to um, the issue of the rise of potential rise of militancy and terrorism in the wake of the uh, emergence of the Taliban as the prominent political force in, in Afghanistan. So a number of um, our audience have asked, will the rise of the Taliban energize terrorist movements elsewhere? And does this have implications on global militancy? Um, some of our audience would like to hear your views about the impact of potential impact of this in Pakistan itself. And others are interested in the potential impact in Southeast Asia as well. You know, um, you mentioned about the rise of terrorism in the past in Afghanistan and then which impacting on the regional countries, Southeast Asia as well. I think we also need to be um, a little realistic and rational. That is the time when uh, Taliban had been completely isolated. Taliban, when they formed the government in the 90s, they were only uh, uh, recognized by three countries, Pakistan, uh, Saudi Arabia, and the UAE. And uh, we were all three closest ally of the United States of America. So we, rec we uh, gave recognition to Afghan Taliban for our own reasons, for our own compulsions at that particular time. But then, um, you know, there was a kind of a huge uh, actions against them, um, campaign against them, which also, and also, uh, and I am not saying they must have formed alliances with some of these groups as well. Now the situation is entirely different. For the last, for instance, uh, uh, 10 years or so almost, uh, they have been recognized as a kind of perhaps the most important entity in Afghanistan. They are engaged with the, by, you know, with, uh, uh, by the international community. But you name any country for that matter which has interest in Afghanistan and they're engaged with Afghan Taliban, not now, but for a very, very long time. I think this engagement is certainly very, very important. And I think that was also part of the commitment that they made with the, uh, with the United States of America, with other uh, members of the international community, that they will certainly take action against those militant organizations they would also sever their links with those organizations. That's number one. Secondly, I think we, the mushroom growth of various organizations that took place in our region or, and uh, elsewhere, that was also the outcome of the geostrategic developments which were taking place in our region, in the Middle East and elsewhere. So um, there was also uh, some kind of a support. Everybody was extending this kind of a support. Uh, there was, uh, you know, money that was that these organizations for were getting from from all over. Uh, but now I think the situation has changed. Uh, those Middle Eastern countries who were also extending support to some of these extremist organizations in the past, they have also stopped extending their this. Uh, uh, thing. So I think probably that is something which is also going to have a major impact on the activities of these terrorist activities in Afghanistan, as well as in, in Pakistan, other regional countries, and um, Southeast Asia for that matter. But then again, I would say that uh, this is a phenomena which would also require uh, closer coordination and cooperation between all countries. Um, so the, you have to develop a portal uh, involving Afghanistan, regional countries and extra regional countries to, for sharing of information. Incidentally, uh, uh, Pakistan hosted a conference of the regional intelligence chiefs uh, last week, uh, this week, I think three days ago, four days ago. And uh, the main purpose of uh, this regional conference of intelligence chiefs was also to develop a mechanism of sharing information and uh, with regard to the activities of these and also taking joint actions. The new dispensation in Afghanistan does not have the capacity to take on these extremist organizations. 
they will continue to pose a threat to us, to you, to uh, the Americans, to everybody. And I think joint efforts are needed on our part to at least develop the capacity of uh, the new dispensation in Afghanistan so that they are able to take on uh, these uh, extremist uh, groups uh, I, you know, uh, in one go or maybe one by one. I'm just sorry, I'm just keeping an eye on the time as well. There's a question that's, that's come up again to, to follow on with something you mentioned earlier. And this is the idea that, um, that the Taliban now has changed from the Taliban that we saw 20 years ago. And um, a number of um, our listeners are, are interested in knowing if um, you believe that the, the sort of, um, the sort of, acceptance at one level of Shia presence in Afghanistan is a long-term commitment or is this something that's going to fade away as we see the Taliban consolidating its, its hold further? And this relates to the lack of inclus inclusive, the lack of inclusivity of the government, the interim government. You, you, you are talking about the referring to the ethnic divide that is taking, you know, that divide, exists. But the question specifically asked about Shias in... Uh, Shia, okay, okay. No, I think the, uh, uh, there is a sizable uh, Shia uh, community uh, in Afghanistan, and they are uh, everywhere, uh, mostly closer to Iran-Afghanistan borders. Uh, Iran and uh, Afghan Taliban, they have developed a lot of trust in the last uh, several years. Um, there is a very, very close coordination between Taliban leadership and the Iranian leadership. And I think uh, the recent events, uh, when um, uh, they, they approached the Shia uh, uh, leaders to join the new government, probably that was a very positive indication on their part. And then, as I mentioned, that they provided protection uh, to the Shia processions, which also shows their high degree of tolerance for uh, uh, for uh, the, this Shia community in Afghanistan. Um, I generally uh, that this is something which was greatly welcomed in Pakistan, welcomed in Pakistan because the, there are uh, these forces uh, who harm Shia interests everywhere, and then uh, you know. See, uh, looking at the pictures of uh, and the videos of Taliban commanders pro giving protection to uh, to uh, the Shia procession was a very positive message that had gone out to uh, many countries outside Afghanistan. And related to that, the final question: Do we see? Do should we fear a further clampdown on the rights of women in Afghanistan? My my own sense is that uh, um, we, Afghanistan women certainly, you know, already there is a positive change in the sense that previously uh, Taliban in the 90s, they were averse to female education, but now they have openly declared that they would encourage female education at the school level, at the college level, at the university level. The only thing that they want is a segregated uh, education for, uh, for women which is also the case in uh, many of the Middle Eastern countries. So I think uh, that by itself would be a positive. You, we don't expect uh, the same rights to, uh, to be given to the women as are available in Pakistan, other South Asian countries, or uh, Singapore, or European countries. But uh, at the same time, I think with the, uh, with the developments taking place in case more and more women uh, are they receive education. Uh, education is uh, kind of encouraged in Afghanistan. Probably the next generation that would uh, come uh, would perhaps be much more tolerant and much more moderate as compared to the current uh, uh, leadership or leadership, I'm not, current cadres of uh, Afghanistan. I think uh, we should keep those hopes high. But then uh, again, the fear is that uh, with the kind of uh, uh, narrative that has been built, uh, the situation could perhaps re lead to, uh, to a, an economic disaster, which will have impact on almost everything that we all uh, 
uh, desire, uh, whether it's uh, the women of Afghanistan, whether it's the common man of uh, Afghanistan, the unemployment, the uh, people who are, uh, you know, less advantaged, they will all suffer in Afghanistan. Ambassador Jilani, thank you. Thank you for sharing your perspectives on this very important topic. And thank you for being so candid in your, in your answers as well. I appreciate your time. Um, as I bring this session to a close, I would like to once again thank Ambassador Jilani, but also thank once again Pakistan's High Commissioner, Ruksana Afzal, and um, Ambassador Ong Keng Yong for facilitating this um, joint seminar. And um, on behalf of everybody listening in, I'd like to thank everybody again. And I'm going to just hand over to my colleague, Kuntavi, who's going to close the session. Thank you, Dr. Iqbal. Um, I'd like again to uh, thank you, say my thanks. Uh, thank you, Ambassador Jelani and Dr. Iqbal for such an interesting and insightful seminar. Special thanks to High Commission of Pakistan for partnering with ISIS in this today's joint seminar. We would also like to thank Her Excellency Ms. Ruksana Afzal, High Commissioner of Pakistan to Singapore, Ambassador Ong Keng Yong, Singapore's non-resident High Commissioner to Pakistan, and Mr. Neng, Mr. Neng Teng Hin, member of ISIS Management Board for joining us today. ISIS is organizing another joint event with the High Commissioner of Pakistan, a panel discussion on Pakistan's digital transformation next Wednesday on September 22nd. Please look out for details about the panel discussion on ISIS website and social media. We look forward to your participation in the upcoming event. Thank you and have a good day. Thank you so much. I enjoyed this uh, very illuminating interactive session. And the, uh, I must say that the, uh, the question that came from um, uh, the participants, they were all very relevant questions and I enjoyed responding to, responding to those questions. Thank you so much. And looking Thank forward you. to such interaction uh, at some other stage as well. Thank you. Thank you, Ambassador. Thank you. Thank you, everyone.